Now, welcome to another in the, well, what has to be fairly short series of road testing and going for a drive in my own car. Today, I'm going to give you the lowdown and the full review of my Volvo 740 1988 GL. In 1982, Volvo replaced the aging 200 series with this, the 700 series. The idea was to modernize it and replace it. Of course, that didn't go exactly to plan because eventually the 200 outlived this and the 900, which replaced this as well. The first car Volvo launched was the 760, the big six cylinder engine and the luxury halo model. Two years later in 1984, the 740 came out with the smaller four cylinder engine. And ultimately in 1985, the one everyone remembers, the thing that made Volvo or kept Volvo famous that they were really well known for, the estate actually didn't arrive until 1985. This of course is a saloon which is technically the less desirable one but it does mean you get an awful lot of car for an awful lot less money because everyone chases the estate versions don't they? Now this is a 740 and initially the 4 in 40 and the 6 in 60 stood for the number of cylinders but over time that line became very blurred and the 4 and 6 just came to mean like a trim level so the 4s were the poverty spec and the 6s were the, the big fancy ones. Now while this shape is now something of an icon, it's an unmistakable piece of styling. It was designed by Jan or Jan Wilsgaard who was Volvo's designer for around 50 years. All of the, uh, the boxy greats came from his pen. Um, at the time it was not well received. Gordon Murray, the fairly well-known designer, um, he described it as obscene and thought we were going backwards in terms of styling and efficiency. Um, he thought it looked like a 1970s Cadillac, which to be fair, it kind of does. He thought they were pandering to the American market, a Europeanized American luxury car. Maybe he wasn't wrong because they did sell a lot of them over there. Uh, this is a car, well, the 200 was already very popular in America and this just kind of cemented that reputation for big, boxy, safe um, sedans and estates. It might not have looked quite exactly like these three lumps of Lego stuck together because he put together 50 different design proposals for this car before they selected this one. Visually, the most obvious changes came in 1989-90 when the headlights became slimmer and the indicators kind of wrapped around further and they made a few of the changes to the scuttle so that things like the windscreen wipers were aerodynamically shielded. On this one, for example, you can see they're very prominent and proud, so they make a bit of wind noise, make a bit of drag. Under the skin, though, the biggest changes happened in 1987-88 when they changed the rear suspension to multi-link. They started galvanizing the entire chassis. Volvo themselves describe it as almost an entirely new car. This car, although it's a 1988 car, seems to have been on the cusp and avoided most of those changes. So this is a 740 in its purest form. Now this car, being the basic 740 entry level, is a two litre, a 1986 CC four cylinder, non-turbocharged. It does have fuel injection though with the Bosch K-Jetronic, which it turns out can actually be quite a nice, reliable, simple system, if it's not in a knackered Mercedes that hasn't moved in 15 or 20 years, like mine. There are a couple other options. There was the B230E, which is the 2.3 four cylinder, which gives a bit more pep. And there's the B28 V6, which is of course the one shared with Renault and more famously, uh, the DeLorean. It's not a great engine in fairness. Although there are only three basic engines, there are 28 different variations on that particular theme. But this is probably the least powerful one. It's 121 horsepower and makes 158 newton meters of torque. That means the 0 to 60 is 13 seconds, and it'll soldier on if you're brave enough to, to risk that wallowy suspension launching you into the sky to 109 miles an hour. And interestingly, that's about the same kind of acceleration and top speed as you get from a similarly engine-sized Rover P6 from, well, the late 60s, really. One really cool thing with these bonnets, though, is like on a Mercedes, you have a service mode. So you pull these little flaps here on left and right hinge, and then you can lift your bonnet almost to vertical, so you need to get better access to the back of the engine or even pull the engine out completely. Not a problem. This is one overriding thing you will find with a Volvo of this era. Everything is really well thought out, really practical and really easy to work on. I've been tinkering with this car for a couple of months now and I have to say it's an absolute doddle to do almost anything, frankly. It's a car that makes you feel welcome under the bonnet. It's not one that fights you particularly much, apart from that little sensor down there, which is horrible. We won't talk about that though. God, it's a long way away now, I can't reach it. That is another thing overridingly you notice with this car. It's very big. Oh. 
Oh. Out the wind, out the sun, I can take my hat off now. It's nice in here. It's a really comfy car. This is the thing that these were known for. Not so much as your ultimate luxury like a Mercedes or ultimate drive machine like a BMW, but just comfy and safe and durable. And that is, well, still the case 30 or 40 years on. The seats in this car are virtually unworn. The only damage on them is where someone's, I think, dropped a cigarette at some point in the last three decades and burnt a little hole. That's not really the car's fault. Um, what has happened though is the plastics have gone a bit brittle. So you might notice the A-pillar is missing its plastic trim from when I tried to remove this to fit the headlining. And it, instead of just pulling off neatly like it should do, it just shattered into lots of little tiny pieces. But, even in basic form, this isn't a badly specced car. You've got electric windows in both front doors, you've got electric mirrors, and you've got a little individual kind of obelisk for both individual mirrors as well. The door release handle is actually a little tag which is recessed inside this trough in the door card. And the idea is that it's safer that way. You can't catch yourself on it in an accident. You, there's nothing to bang onto. Everything is safely behind this piece of plastic here and it's all padded all around it. So they were thinking very strongly in terms of safety on every level at all times with this car. Door mirrors are nice and big and there's a little kind of dashed line and half of it is kind of at a different angle so you don't have a blind spot quite so badly on it. They were thinking all the time, always thinking. There are door pockets down here, they're, they're quite uh, narrow and the aperture to get into them is actually quite tight as well. Um, so it's a bit of a tricky thing to use but you can get odds and sods in there. The car does have central locking. Now the dashboard is very angular, very square. I guess that is kind of slightly aping the 70s American style. It's also kind of the end of the 70s style from Europe as well. Everything else is going curvy and, and uh, flowing. Volvo were not. They were sticking with their uh, good old fashioned or good old favorite boxy but good as the advert didn't actually say in real life. The instrument binnacle is big and clear. The speedo, up to 140 miles an hour, is right in the center. Nice little short stubby needle that going around to big, clear, white fonted um, numbers so you can see exactly where you're going. And it's got kilometers an hour in the middle as well. On the left, you've got a big clock. On the right, you've got a big rev counter, red lining at 6,000 RPM. And on either side of that, you've got a fuel gauge and a temperature gauge, all nice and clear and legible. There, there is this not completely legible is of course, the steering wheel doesn't move up and down. So I'm actually looking a lot at the rim of the wheel in this particular case. I'm going to have to move now. Even though it's a dead end track in the middle of nowhere, it's, this appears to be the most busy dead end track in all of Great Britain. So the steering wheel doesn't move. It's a nice thing to hold. It's got like a thick, chunky, rubbery rim, which is good. The center is padded, it's not airbag, but it's padded. So if you just bang into it, it shouldn't hurt you. And you've got two little horn buttons here on the, on the left and right stalks. Power on for a little footage. It's a bit peepy, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's a bit, uh, bit noddyish. Not quite befitting for a car as chunky as it. It's possible this should be a dual tone horn, and one of the horns has packed up. So I'll hold, I'll reserve judgment on that right now. Either side of the dials, we've got air vents, big central ones here for the middle of the car, little ones left and right for the, uh, the front passengers, and huge vents for the windscreen, and also vents in the top of the door as well. This is a car designed to be driven in all conditions, hot and cold, so it's got amazing demisting properties, and also, even though it's not air conditioned, it's pretty decent cooling uh, capabilities as well. And below this level, we've got our switch gear. Uh, just a simple turn knob for the side lights and headlights over on the far right, then a blanking plate, then your rear fogs. I'm going to assume the blanking plate just here would be your front fogs, which this car doesn't have. Then on the other side, you've got your rear screen heater, then three other blanking plates. The control stalks are really tiny and slender. They are just crazy small, considering how big the car is and how sort of solid everything else is. These little stalks, the indicator on the left and the wipers on the right, I like pixie things. They're, they're designed for, for the little people to play with. Um, but I'm assuming they're fairly robust because they're not showing any signs of damage. And also really curiously positioned um, hazard warning light. It's up on the top left of the um, steering column. Oh, quite hard to turn off, off and on again. Um, so you can't actually find it in a hurry. It, it does illuminate red when it's flashing, which is great to find it when it's on, but not so great for finding when it's turned off. The heating ventilation is a masterclass in simplicity. You've got basically three controls and that's it. Just a simple zero to four for the fan, face to feet to screen on the top slider and hot and cold. That's, I suppose that's really all you need. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a nice simple plan. It would be nice It would be nice if this car did have air conditioning, which was available on the more luxurious models, but uh, this car didn't get that sadly. 
Underneath that, you've got a very old fashioned looking radio cassette player with L and M. Pretty simple, pretty basic. It's got five buttons down the front of it. Um, but I'll be honest, it struggles a bit getting much because it's pretty old and tired. Carrying on down, we've got a little cigarette lighter and a large kind of felty, felty lined small cubby hole, which is, it's just big enough to put a phone into. But if you do, it's kind of possible to not get third or fifth if the phone's at a bit of an angle. So I wouldn't recommend putting anything bigger than an iPhone 6 in there, to be honest. Below there, you've got the ashtray, which actually folds right out, and you've got your fuse box hidden behind there, which is uh, crafty and also quite useful, so you can find it in a hurry if, for example, you're getting ready for the MOT and the side lights have gone. And you've got the choice of a four-speed auto or a four-speed manual with electric overdrive or a five-speed gearbox, as this car has. Considering these aren't known as driver's cars, this is actually a really quite a nice gearbox as well. It's uh, quite solid and quite sort of snickety and clunky into each gear. It feels like you're doing some work with it. It doesn't snag or burr as you move it through the gears. It's just a nice thing to use. Now, because Scandinavian, we've got heated seats down here. And obviously one for each of the front seats, nothing in the back. Kids in the back need to shiver. Nice big manual handbrake, and then a huge cubby hole thing, which it turns out is just the right size to act as a tea shelf, because you can put your nice large modern insulated cup in here, and it'll, it'll stay more or less upright. If you've got two of them, they'll wedge each other quite happily and uh, make it even safer than before. That's actually quite a useful, practical little, little storage hole. The fabric on these seats is fantastic. It's like a lovely stripy velour. We all love a bit of velour, don't we? It's the best. It's so soft, and regardless of what the temperature is outside, it's just a nice temperature to sit onto. Um, so it's always a good thing. They're very big, square, and flat. They're not going to—they're um, not going to constrain you and hold you in as if you do any kind of adventurous, rapid cornering. They're more—they are literally built for comfort, not for speed. Also, they're built for safety because they've got excellent ergonomics in the back and these headrests are incredible. So if you are involved in any kind of accident, it will save your neck for you. The only other thing to mention here in the front is, of course, the glove box, which uh, is an OK size, but does have, notably, a twin tea shelf. So you can take your cups out, sandwiches will sit on here quite happily, and you've got dipping space. So if you want, maybe, want to go a bit more adventurous, get some chicken nuggets with dips, you can have your chicken nuggets on here and your dips in the dip recess. Hmm. Let's have a look in the back. Remember folks, a Volvo is for life, not just for Christmas. You've got a ton of room back here. Um, because this is a very long car, there is a lot of space inside it. And I, I've never sat in the back of this really before. Um, and, and it's my own car. You do have a big view of the back of the headrest because that's a big solid headrest and a big solid chair as well. But there's ventilation underneath the, the front seats to go blow into the back so the rear passengers aren't completely chilled or frozen. Um, so my feet are just brushing on that air vent. But my toe room isn't bad. Um, I've got loads of knee room, loads of elbow room. There are three seats across. And I think it'd be quite a comfortable thing to sit in three across. Uh, headroom is fantastic. If you look at the roof line of this car, it just goes on and on and on and then just comes straight back way behind where I'm sitting. So I've got a ton of headroom. Uh, I could be wearing a hat in here quite happily, quite a tall hat at that. So I've still got the same lovely velour and soft comfiness. Uh, pockets in the back of both bins. Um, a little ashtray back here. Got the same safety door handles. Uh, unfortunately, blanking plates where electric windows could be and manual windows. Oh, yeah. But you do get speakers in both doors. It's interesting though to note, the rear door speaker grills are completely different to the front door speaker grills. These are a vertical plastic molded thing, whereas the front ones are trying to sort of shout radio and hi-fi and stuff, and a metal uh, grills with a kind of a mesh on them. So very different look, interesting style choicing. Styling choice, I should say. A big old parcel shelf around the back there, ideal for handkerchiefs and stuffed toys. And now a great bit of volvo edge here, something which, uh, I'd kind of forgotten about and now I've rem been reminded of, I'm so glad to have it back in my life, the red flashing ticky ticky seatbelt light. Um, it only actually works with the front seatbelt, so the people in the back could have their seatbelts off and it wouldn't flash because this one flashes in sync with the one that's in the, uh, in the dashboard below the speedo. But if you turn the car on and don't have a seatbelt on, you get your tick 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 and this red light flashing to remind you to be safe because it's a Volvo and we need to be safe in a Volvo. Right, last thing before we go for a drive, let's look in the boot and take it on the road.
Now, despite being such a massive car, the trunk area isn't that vast. Compared to the estate, it's actually not that impressive at all. It does go back a long way, but it's quite shallow. The fuel tank does kind of, in fact, I say it's not that big, my voice is echoing in here right now. <laughs> it goes back a long way, but it's quite shallow because the fuel tank does intrude quite a long way. And this full size spare wheel is under here as well. You've got a recess on either side of the boot, so you can put quite large things in there. This has actually got a big bottle of oil in there and there's room to spare, but fit two of those in each of these little pockets. There is a, a ski hatch, so you can put longer, small things through, but they are literally for skis and pretty much nothing else. Maybe a, a folded up Christmas tree or a very long umbrella, but the rear seats don't fold down, so that's your best option for getting long things through this car. And uh, that's kind of it in the back of here. Um, it is very sensible access to the tail lights because you just unscrew one little kind of plastic knob and you can get to the bulbs quite happily there. Now, the sound of the boot floor, you do have a spare tire, which despite being under the boot floor is still tied down with a strap and you have the Volvo toolkit so you can get yourself out of whatever trouble you've got yourself into and that is the boot now although on the road it does feel quite refined and quite quiet it's got a lovely little kind of tinkly sound to it as well um, when it first starts when the engine first starts up it does have a certain agricultural roar to it but with just so much sound deadening under the thick carpet you soon lose most of the road noise and engine noise I've got to be honest, it does feel like a big car on the road. And that's with a very good reason. This thing is 15.8 feet long, or in terms I can understand, 4.75 meters. That is absolutely vast. It's about 120 millimeters longer than the old 200 was, but it's actually a lighter car by a couple of kilos, and it's got a lower drag coefficient as well. that you particularly notice <laughs> but still in this form doesn't feel especially rapid it wallows like nothing else and when I first drove this I actually thought maybe it needed new suspension because this has got a fair few miles on the clock this is this is a uh, currently sitting at 145,000 miles so I did think maybe the springs or shocks were on well just had it but and I started reading accounts from back in the 80s where talking about kids would um, go out to their dad's new Volvo 700, bounce the front and see how many times they could make the, uh, the bonnet go up and down and how long it would take for it to settle after they wobbled it. So it turns out it's actually normal. It's completely correct to be just more wallowy than any boat you care to name. But it does mean you can just glide over speed humps as if they're not there. Uh, bad road surfaces just mean nothing to this car. All you get is a, a muted thump thump from the suspension. It also helps that it's only got 14 inch wheels, so the tyres themselves are actually quite tall, so you get even more suspension on top of the already quite impressive largely large amount of suspension. Thing about it being quite a big car is the fact it's also got those massive safety bumpers. I mean, if you look at them, they are huge, absolutely vast, and uh, that can make it. If you're not used to driving one of these, that can make parking a little bit troublesome. And I've not actually done it yet myself, but I've come incredibly close. When you pull up to places, you can see the end of the bonnet, as you would in a regular car, and you pull up with the bonnet just short of whatever it is that you're, you're stopping in front of, a garage door, a wall, a, a, you know, a fence or something. You have to remember you've got another six inches or so of, uh, of bumper in front of that, and uh, it would be very easy indeed to miscalculate and put the front bumper through that wall or garage door or fence. Uh, I'll say I've, I've pulled up a couple of times with the bumper literally millimetres from a solid object, whilst thinking I was quite a long way away still. 
The other thing to worry about is people trying to squeeze past the car in tight traffic because most modern cars don't have amazing below the waistline view and they might not be aware of how far the bumpers stick out from this car and so if they're trying to squeeze past they could quite easily clonk into it. In fact this car has had a clonk on the front during its last owner's tenure and I need to replace that front bumper. I, I guess maybe something like that happened and he'd had the car for about 30 odd years. Now I mentioned this is the uh, lowest trim level, the GL. There were a few other levels as well. There was the GLE, the SE, the GLT and the Turbo. The Turbo was really the one to go for. And these things were astonishingly popular. There was a whole there was a whole middle class of people who didn't necessarily want to keep up the Joneses badge snobbery of a BMW or a Mercedes, wanted something a bit different and a bit more reliable and maybe a bit safer than a Ford or a Vauxhall, certainly more than a Peugeot or a Renault. And they bought these things in droves all around the world, especially in at home in Sweden, you couldn't move for these things. In the UK, in America, all across Europe, Australia, everywhere, these things found a niche and they hammered home. They filled it so tightly. There's a certain kind of person who bought these things. And they were probably fairly well educated, maybe, well, probably quite well, probably quite well off as well. They tended to be kind of nice people bought these things. You, you probably wouldn't find one of these in the car park at a National Front rally, put it that way. And all these years on, 32 years later, this still just feels so dependable, so safe. The gearbox is still tight. Everything is just really well made. This is an incredibly good car. But these things were incredibly popular. They made about 1.4 million of them in the end all churning out of that factory in Sweden. Now the thing that this was really criticised for at the time wasn't anything to do with the build quality or the comfort or that kind of stuff, but really it was the handling and the, well, was the lack of handling because it just, just rolls into corners like a ship in a gale. Um, so yeah, if you wanted a car with extremely good dynamics, you'd have to go to the opposition, you'd go and buy a BMW. But this car was, wasn't really built with that in mind, it was built with safety and practicality. These seats are, in, are adjustable in terms of lumbar and squab height as well, so you can get the perfect seating position. You've got amazing view out of all the windows, a big, big greenhouse area, lots of glass in the car. You've got headlight washers and wipers on the front of the thing, so you're always going to be able to see clearly in the dark. It's got the big crumple zones, the big impact absorbent bumpers. You could choose this thing with three different rear axles, a standard one, a heavy duty one for towing and uh, big heavy weights, and a limited slip diff one for performance. So if you were going to drag race a moose and crash into an elk, this was the car to do it in. This is a great car on a long journey as well. I mean, apart from being effortlessly comfortable on a B road, get it on the motorway and it hits 70 miles an hour and it just cruises, it's about 4,000 RPM so the engine is ticking over a little bit fast but it's quiet, it's comfortable, it just wafts down the road when you get the bad concrete sections of the M25 for example it doesn't deafen you like it does in a modern car it just soaks it all up and uh, makes it a comfortable, nice place to be if only the radio worked better <laughs> Now, incredibly, I'm only the second owner of this car in its 32-year life. First owner, bought it brand new in 1988 from Horsham, Volvo dealer that's not there anymore, and I bought it from him just a couple of months ago. And hopefully, the work I've done to it in the last few months means it's got another 30 years in it, fingers crossed. Thanks for watching, I really hope you've enjoyed this little drive out in my massive Volvo. Um, this thing is a ridiculous tank of a car, the last owner nicknamed it Sherman. I'm, I'm more inclined to call it Moby to be perfectly honest, like the whale, not the singer or musician.
I hope you've enjoyed this. Please let me know what you think in the comments. I know everyone seems to adore this car from what I read in the comments anyway. And it's a car that I've become rather attached to and it's quite interesting to sort of learn a little bit more about it. And thanks for watching, I hope you've enjoyed. I know I say every time and I know it annoys some people, but I have to remind you guys, I really do appreciate it if you can. Please hit like, please hit subscribe, please share this on Facebook, tell your friends, all that good stuff. And I'll see you again next time in, well, who knows what.